Welcome to church tonight. We're glad that you're here. Uh, for those of you that were just in our new convert, new member class, uh, this is round two for you. So we're, we're glad that everyone's here this evening. Grateful to be able to have the opportunity to study God's word tonight. Turn to Proverbs, if you will. Proverbs chapter 23. No, Proverb 23. There aren't actually chapters. You know, that's one of the things you learn over time. Not, not actually chapters in the book of Proverbs. They're Proverbs. So Proverb 23 is where you need to be in Scripture this evening, and we're going to look at verses 6, 7, and 8. Proverbs 23, verses 6, 7, and 8. Eat, not, eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. So the book of Proverbs gives us all sorts of wisdom for living. And oftentimes uh, the book of Proverbs can kind of shift in its theme and its topic and its idea very quickly. Uh, it's believed to be a book that's compiled by the writing of, of several men, uh, that very wise men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And many times you see them begin with the words, my son. And so it's the idea of a fatherly type figure who's trying to pass on wisdom to his children. And of course, that theme works very well in that God is our heavenly father, right? And so, and we are his children. And so he's trying to pass wisdom on to us. And in this particular little short passage we just read, we got a description and a warning from the writer to us that we need to be careful about who we eat with. Now, what really the context that we get here is he's talking about the idea of, of being careful who we eat with, but, but that's, that's, that's just part of the idea and part of the teaching here. Yeah. What, he's, what he's kind of telling us is we need to be wary and careful of a person's attitude, of a person's attitude. Have you ever, and you have, you just, just nod your head because you have, have you ever encountered someone that you knew was irritated with you, upset with you, angry somehow, but they were trying to act like they weren't? Raise your hand. Yes, we all have, right? Uh, if you're a husband in the room, every one of us have had this experience, right? All of a sudden, she's not as nice as she was earlier, and you don't know why. And boy, it's when you don't know why that you get nervous, isn't it? So actually tonight, this is going to be a marital class, marital counsel. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But that, that's happened, right? All of a sudden, you notice the attitude has changed. And what the writer here of Proverbs is trying to help us understand is that we need to be wary and mindful of other people's attitudes. But by implication... This passage is also warning us and cautioning us to be mindful of our own attitude. And so that's what we're going to discuss for just a few minutes this evening. We're going to look at several passages of Scripture that talk to us and teach us about our attitudes. An attitude can be something that we perceive very quickly and easily in someone else but it can be something that we overlook and pay very little attention to in our own hearts and minds. So tonight, for a few moments, let's consider what Scripture has to say about our attitudes. came across a story about a cranky old man. He was just always had something mean to say. He's always irritated and aggravated. His grandson visited his home one afternoon while he was taking a nap. And so the grandson, knowing how his grandfather was, decided he'd play a little prank on him. And he took some Limburger cheese and rubbed it on his mustache 
just above his nose. Grandpa wakes up, takes a deep breath, and he exclaims, this room stinks. So he walks out of the room and he takes another breath. Well, this, this kitchen stinks. He starts walking around to the different rooms in the house and he realizes this house stinks. So to try to escape the smell, he opens his front door, walks out on the front porch, takes a deep breath, and then he comes to the conclusion that the whole world stinks. Now, did the bedroom stink? Did the kitchen actually stink? Did the house really stink? And did the whole world stink? No. The problem wasn't with everywhere else. The problem was with him. And the problem was right underneath his cranky old nose. And that's kind of how attitude can affect every one of us. We may not be very aware of our attitude, but others perceive it, and it affects the way we live. It affects the way we think. It affects how we speak to others, how we treat people. It affects our actions. Attitude. Let's talk about attitude this evening. Three scriptural truths about our attitude. Number one, your attitude reveals the real you. Your attitude reveals the real you. Matthew chapter 15, verse 17. Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. And this was a subject that Jesus had to deal with constantly with the religious professionals. They were always irritated at the little minutia that Jesus didn't observe regarding the law. One of those things was making sure your hands were washed before you ate. And I believe that occasionally Jesus didn't wash his hands before he ate just to pick a fight with these guys just to get, help them understand this is not the law. This is not what makes me right with God. And he, he, he uses this illustration to make this bigger point here. He says, you have this idea that what goes into your mouth defiles you. Now, we're not talking about health-wise. We're, we're just talking about religious things here. And the Jews, that, that was what they would have said. If I eat with unwashed hands, then I'm unclean. I'm ceremonially unclean. He says, you guys have this idea that what goes into my mouth is what defiles me. And really what defiles you is what's already inside. Amen. It's what's in your sinful, wicked, nasty, filthy, deceitful human heart. And I believe that's a theme that we, especially here in America, need to remind ourselves of regularly. What does the Bible say about my heart? It's wicked. Oh, it just goes through me when I hear someone on TV or some movie or sitcom or whatever, what have you say, well, just follow your heart. Or you know you have a good heart. No, you don't. Sometimes I scream it at the TV, even though they can't hear me. No, you don't have a good heart. That actor or actress on the television doesn't have a good heart. You don't have a good heart. I don't have a good heart. Even, even Curtis Linton. I, I know. Steve Dane, he almost fell over, Pastor. He almost fell over. He couldn't believe it. That's what the Bible tells us, right? I don't like that truth. I like to think I'm a good person, but I'm not. And it's something I have to remember when it comes to my attitude. I tend, when it comes to my attitude, I tend to be selfish. I tend to be prideful. 
concerned about me and what, how people treat me and how I feel all the time. And if that's the type of attitude I am having, then it's revealing the real me. It reveals the real you. Your attitude represents your disposition, your outlook on life, and attitude eventually turns into action. Attitude eventually turns into action. This illustration may not work very well because it's a big room, and uh, I think you'll get it. I'll explain it to you for those of you who may not be able to see. I've got a, a water bottle here. has some water in it, good, clean, fresh water. And I've got the lid on, but I'm just going to put that lid on really loose so it's, it's not very tight. Now, I'm going to shake this water bottle. Can anybody see what's happening here? I can see very easily, but you may be so far away. Steve, you're too old to see what's going on, so I'll explain it to you. Water is coming out of the lid. Now, why did water come out of the bottle? Well, we could, we could try and diagnose what happened, right? And I've got a point. We're getting somewhere in just a moment. Well, he shook the bottle, right? That, that may be part of it. Or the, the lid, if he just put the lid on more tightly, that, that might have kept it. If he hadn't had the lid on so loosely, then it wouldn't. Have. You know the real reason water came out of that bottle when I shook it with the lid on loosely? Because it had water in it. That's what's in the bottle. So when the outward circumstances change in this bottle's existence, some idiot starts shaking it and decides to loosen the, 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 the lid, though it may be unfair to this bottle, whatever's in it is going to come out of it. We can blame circumstances all we want to. But the real reason that we have the attitude that we do, it's not because of how so-and-so treated you. It's not because of any other circumstance in your life. It's because that's what you've chosen to have inside you, in your heart and in your mind. Attitude eventually turns into actions. What's on the inside is bound to come out. It, the way we think affects everything about us, how we act, how we talk. Do you remember playing with a jack-in-the-box when you were a kid? I mean, kids nowadays probably don't ever play with a jack-in-the-box, but I'm still old enough to remember a jack-in-the-box. And you had this little clown probably on top of a spring and you put it down the lid and then you turn the little handle. And Jack pops out of the box, right? And every time Jack pops out of the box, you got a little bit of a, a jolt. The kid gets a little bit of a, 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 a scare or a jump or a little bit of a, a thrill. At least expect it. Here comes Jack popping up out of the box. And that's a pretty good picture of our attitude. Circumstances, they aren't what make us who we are. They are what reveal who we are. My circumstances. Um, we have two young boys that we're raising and occasionally they'll make a statement like this. Well, Dad, it's just not fair. And I'll be honest, as their father, I wish it was always fair for them. I do. I wish they were always treated fairly. I wish they always felt good about how everything that everyone had to say about them, about every circumstance in life. As their dad, I selfishly wish it was always fair. But I have enough sense to know that that is what life is made of. And so my usual response when they try that or mention that it's not fair, I just tell them, son, you might as well get used to it because life ain't fair. Amen? Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, it's just not fair. And so we're always, there's always going to be something we don't like about our circumstances. It could always be better. We could always have some greener grass. 
but the color of your grass is not makes what makes you who you are. It just reveals who you are. Your circumstances reveal who you are. So your attitude reveals the real you. Number two, your attitude determines the success or failure of every relationship in your life. Your attitude determines the success or failure of every relationship in your life. And I want us to look at a particular passage of Scripture that bears this out. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1. Now to give you just a little bit of background here, you've got the children of Israel. God has used Moses to bring the people out of centuries of Egyptian slavery. They're wandering in the wilderness. God's also using Moses' brother, Aaron, and his sister, Miriam. They are also influencers among the children of Israel. And Miriam gets a little bit upset with Moses. Let's pick up in Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he'd married an Ethiopian woman. And they said... Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses. So Miriam, Moses' brother or sister, has started running her mouth about Moses. You know, Moses thinks he's something. But God's used me and Aaron too. He's not the only one that deserves any credit around here. And God heard her. And God dealt with that gossip. He got her and Aaron and Moses alone and he came down and said, listen, if I put a prophet among my people, I speak to him in visions, but not with your brother. With your brother, I speak to him apparently. In other words, I tell him exactly what I want him to hear right out of my mouth. And he beholds the similitude of the Lord. So he's saying, Moses is someone that I am using for a special purpose at a special time in a very special way. And then you notice what he asked him? He said, when you think about what I'm doing with Moses, what in the world made you think you had the right to question my purpose and my use of my man? Amen. He got upset. And then go on with me in verse 9, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And he departed, and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. And for that portion of the story, Moses goes on to ask God to heal Miriam, and God chooses to do so. But if you'll notice at the beginning of that story, Miriam begins to question Moses. The Bible tells us it's because he married an Egyptian woman. Now, was the fact that Moses married the Egyptian woman really all there was to it for Miriam? To cause her to talk like this against God's man? No, it was just the circumstance that shook her bottle. You get what I'm saying here? Talking about attitude. That's just shaking her bottle. There was already on the inside what was getting ready to come out. You see what I'm saying? Miriam was jealous of Moses. She was jealous of what God was doing through Moses. But by the way, 
if you study the life of Moses, I mean really study it, I don't know that I want to trade places with Moses. My man had a rough life. Hey, God used him, grateful for him and what God did through him. But Moses had a rough go. It was tough. But Miriam's jealous. And her jealousy is what's inside. That Ethiopian woman just shook the bottle. See what I'm saying? Her attitude came out in the end. It revealed and it had an effect on her relationship with her brother. Let me ask you this, and we don't really know this, we just kind of assume this, but what do you think her relationship with Moses was like from then on? Probably at the best, strained, right? I mean, the leader of her people, her own blood brother. I mean, Moses probably never, and, and, and we see that it appears that Moses was willing to forgive and, and move on, but Moses may have never looked at her again the same. Why? Because of her stupid jealousy. Because that's what she poured into her bottle. Jealousy. Why can't that be me? Why does he have what I don't have? Why can't I be the leader? Why can't God use me like that? And she poured that sorry attitude into her bottle. And when circumstances came around and the straw broke the proverbial uh, camel's back, what came out of the bottle? That attitude. Our attitude determines the success or failure of every relationship in our life. I want you to think for a moment about some of the different types of relationships that each of us have. What are some of the different types of relationships that, that we have as human beings? Somebody give me an idea. Relatives, we each have relatives in here, right? Uh, we, many of us have spouses, husband, wife. We, many of us have children, have grandchildren. We have coworkers, we have neighbors. All these different relationships, ways that we're connected to one another. And potentially as family members, as spouses, we're very closely and intimately connected to one another. And then the circle kind of diminishes as we go out, right? Further extended family, neighbors, things of that nature, acquaintances, maybe people in the neighborhood that we happen to pass and repass, maybe the uh, lady at the donut shop that fills up your cup of coffee, what have you. All of those are ways in which we're connected to other people. They all represent different types of relationships. And each of those relationships is heavily affected by what I think about that person, right? That's why, for the most part, the people the furthest out, we probably get along okay with. The, 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 the person that we've come to recognize their face in the checkout line at whatever store you shop at. Or like I said, maybe the server at a, a restaurant you frequent. You get along with those people. You don't know them very well. We aren't very intimately connected. The closer we get into that circle, the better we know those people, right? The better we know those people, the greater potential for them to hurt us and for us to hurt them. And the greater we know them and the greater that potential, the more important it is what we allow ourselves to think about those people. Because what I think about you is going to very heavily influence how I feel about you and how I relate to you and how I treat you. It's important what we allow ourselves to think about our spouses about our children, about our grandchildren, about our church family, right? Because that affects my attitude towards those individuals. The people I don't know so well, not nearly as big a deal. But the closer we get in, the more important it is that I pay attention to what I think and how I think about those people. When they hurt me, it's that much more important that I forgive, right? Right? 
Because it matters. We're close. It matters what I think. It matters my attitude and how I treat you. When In this church family, and there's only a portion of us represented here this evening, but in this church family, it matters what we think about one another. It matters the conclusions we come to about one another's life. It matters when we may hurt one another that we make it right or at least try to because it affects our attitude and our attitude is going to matter regarding the, the success or failure of every relationship we have in our life. So three thoughts about attitude tonight. Number one, your attitude reveals the real you. Number two, your attitude determines the success or failure of every relationship in your life. And number three, and most importantly, your attitude is your choice. Amen. Your attitude is your choice. The root of our attitudes is our thoughts. If I want to take charge of my attitude, I must take charge of the way I think. Amen. And how often do you pay much attention to what you think and how you think? I would guess we don't pay that much attention. I'll give you an illustration. You have a friend. That friend hurts you. I mean, really wounds you. I mean, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, but they hurt you. As you're hurt and offended, when you think of that individual, what's the first thing you're going to think of? What they did, right? How they offended, how they hurt you, how they wounded you. And every time that person comes up in conversation, every time their name is mentioned, every time that I think on them, if I'm not in charge of my thoughts... I'm going to automatically replay in my mind what they did and how they hurt me. And if I'm not in charge of my thoughts, if I'm not in charge of my thoughts, then forgiveness will be nearly impossible. Amen. How do you forgive someone when every time you think of them, you rehearse what they did to hurt you? Can you forget it? No, we're not like God. We don't have the delete key that we can forget. We do not. But we can choose not to dwell on it. See what I'm saying? And I'm just using the illustration of trying to forgive someone that's hurt me. But we can apply this into all, all the different ways that we think about one another. If I, and, and about our life and about our circumstances. If I'm constantly thinking negative thoughts then what sort of attitude am I going to live my life with? A negative attitude. I can't help it. But I can help what I think about and how I think about it. I just choose not to very often. So to take charge of my attitude is to take charge of my thoughts. And how do we take charge of our thoughts? Can I share three thoughts with you? And we'll close with these, okay? Number one, we must fix our thoughts. We must fix our thoughts. Hebrews 12, 13. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. That phrase there we read in verse 13, make straight paths. You know what the writer here is telling us? Pay attention. Be intentional. Do this on purpose. You, it's your responsibility to create straight pads for your feet, to order your thoughts, to order your attitude, to order your outlook on life by what I'm paying attention to, by what I'm feeding into my mind. I'm going to fix my thoughts on the right things. I must fix my thoughts. Number two, we must filter our thoughts. We must filter our thoughts. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
We have a responsibility to distinguish between what's of the world and what's of God. We all understand the concept of a filter, right? Our vehicles have various filters. We have air filters and oil filters and uh, gas filters and all sorts of other filters. Machines, equipment that we have, it has a filter, at least one probably, that greatly affects the performance of the machine, right? If you don't consistently change the oil filter to an engine, then it's going to degrade that oil over time, and that degraded oil isn't going to lubricate the engine for its optimal performance, right? We all understand this concept. Well, what about our spirits? What about my, my inner man that the Bible talks about? It's my responsibility to filter what goes into my heart and mind. Yet how often do we really intentionally do this? He just told us, that she may prove what's acceptable, what good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You need to be able to distinguish between what's of the world and what's of God. And this is an everyday thing. This is a moment by moment thing. This is a lifestyle. This is a way of looking at the world and myself and others around me. I need to fix my thoughts. If I'm going to control them, I've got to fix them. I've got to filter them. And thirdly, we must feed our thoughts. Philippians 4 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. God doesn't just give us instructions on what we're to do with our hands and our feet and our bodies. He does. He doesn't just give us instruction on what we're to do with our mouth. He does. Doesn't just give us instruction on what we're to do with our ears. He does. What we're to do with our eyes. He does. But he also gives us very clear, loving instruction on what we're to do with our mind how I'm supposed to think, what I'm supposed to think on. That's important. If I'm going to take charge of my attitude, it starts by taking charge of my thoughts. How do I take charge of my thoughts? Scripture teaches us we've got to fix our thoughts, we've got to filter our thoughts, and we've got to feed our thoughts. How do I feed my thoughts? Man, it's easier today than it ever has been to feed your thoughts and there's all sorts of streaming services that stream Christian music. I love personally to listen to podcasts, Christian podcasts. There are all sorts of, of, of means by which you can stream Bible teaching and preaching, stuff for free. Now, be careful. Be mindful of what you're listening to. If you have a question, I would encourage you to consult Pastor Linton or, or consult myself. But those are easy ways for us to, man, you're getting ready in the morning, just turn on YouTube and hit a Christian song. Feed, feed yourself the right things. I mean, if we want to have a right attitude, we've got to get down to the root of our attitude. That's what we think about. And I'm in charge of that. I need to take charge of that. I'm not just some child anymore who just lives however what it, and it just deals with whatever comes my way. No, we're adults. And we're supposed to be in charge of our day, in charge of our lifestyle, and in charge of our thoughts. I think we can all agree that attitudes are a very important part of our lives. And it's our individual choice. You get to choose. I'm going to share just a little bit more with you, and we'll be closing here in just a few minutes. But you've heard me, if you've heard me preach or teach much, I've referenced this individual uh, several times. As a matter of fact, we were just at lunch today with uh, CJ and Deanne Brown, and uh, this individual happened to come up. My mom's mom, we called her Granny. Uh, Granny moved in to our home when I was seven. She passed away when I was 17, just before I graduated from high school. So she lived there with us for about 10 years. And Granny had a very difficult life. She really did, man. The circumstances of my grandmother's life, as they've been related to me by my mom, were very difficult. She was married three times. Her first two uh, marriages uh, involved a lot of physical abuse. Uh, and so she was divorced twice. 
Her third husband, who she had my mother uh, with, uh, he died when my mother was a child. And so she was a single mom raising three children by two different marriages back in a time when that wasn't cool. And I'm not saying it's cool now. I don't mean to be flippant. But there's just a lot more available in the way of assistance now. And even the way people look at that, it's not, uh, it just doesn't have the same uh, uh, stigma to it now that it would have then. Uh, she had worked very hard. Her children were latchkey kids. Nothing came easy to my grandmother. And as a result, those circumstances, she kept pouring negativity into her bottle for decades. By the time I really was old enough to know much about my granny. Uh, she was the type of woman that she may say hello or she may curse at you. You just never knew when you walked in the door. I knew as her grandson that she loved me, but boy, she just, she was tough. And as I got a little older, we would take my granny to Memphis, Tennessee to see one of her brothers and his wife. And it was my great uncle and great aunt. We called them Uncle Click and Aunt Lib. And you know what I was thinking about that as I was writing that in my notes? That reminds me of the names of people from Hoyt, Click and Lib. So I've, I've even got some Hoyt-type names in my family. And I'm, I'm kind of proud of that, to be honest with you. Because I feel like Brother Linton, he has all the cool names, you know, of all the, all the people that he knows. But we go out there to see Aunt Lib. And again, by the time I got to know my Aunt Lib, she was a very elderly lady. Uh, Aunt Lib had crippling emphysema. She couldn't walk more than a few steps without having to stop and take a break. She was constantly on oxygen. She also had a vision uh, 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 problem where, and I don't know what it's called, I'm sure there's a term for it, where she only, the only vision she had left was her peripheral vision. She couldn't look dead on at anything. She just had peripheral vision. So if she was going to look at anything, it had to be a very bright light, had to have a magnifying glass. Uh, she loved to play games and she'd always have the extra large versions of whatever sort of games she wanted to play. But my Aunt Lib was one of the sweetest women that I ever knew. And I always looked forward to traveling out to Memphis, Tennessee to see Aunt Lib because I knew what her attitude was going to be when I got there. She was going to be glad to see me. She was going to be glad that we were spending time together. She was going to be happy to see everybody else. And as I grew up and got older and began to think on things like what we're talking about tonight, the idea of our attitude and how it's in our control, it's in your hands, I began to contrast and compare these two ladies. Both had circumstances in life that could have justified in their minds a bad attitude, right? Could have justified for both of them to be very cynical about life. And one chose to do so. One chose to become very cynical about life, very negative. And one chose the opposite. Amen. Every day she got up, in spite of her circumstances, she chose to, to uh, tackle that with a different attitude. And that same choice is yours tonight. If people could interview, be interviewed about you, you know, if we could line up all of our church family, or maybe even your family members, those that know you well, if we could line them up and say, hey, tell me about Bob Eberly. You know, tell me about John Graves. Give me your opinion, your thoughts on them. What would they say about your attitude? How would they, how would they classify you? Man, they're, they're, they're good to get along with. I like being around those people. Or man, I love them. Oof. When they're coming around, I know I'm going to get an earful. How would people classify you? What would other people think of you? I want to share this quote and we're done. I've shared it before, but I can't help, I can't resist sharing this quote when we talk about the idea of attitude. It's by Chuck Swindle, and I don't agree with everything Chuck Swindle says or teaches, but this is good stuff. The longer I live, he says, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day 
regarding the attitude we'll embrace for that day. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. And then he says this. You've probably heard this before, but boy, it's so good. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. 10% what happens to me, 90% how I react to it. We are in charge of our attitudes. May God help us to steward them in a way that pleases him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we have an inspiration every day for a good attitude in spite of circumstances that may work against us. And all of us have circumstances in life that we don't like, that seem unfair or difficult or challenging. But God, because you loved us so much that you came to this earth, died for our sins, rose from the grave three days, three days later, and have given us the privilege to be able to put our faith in you and be right with our God and creator and Lord and Savior. Lord, that is inspiration enough for a good attitude every day of our lives. And so we pray, as I concluded this message, we pray that you'd help us to take seriously the idea of stewarding our attitude. We think about stewarding our time. We think about stewarding our influence, stewarding our income. But Lord, you've called us to steward our attitude. And may we do that tonight, this week, this month, this year. And Lord, as we do that, Lord, we believe that it's going to have an influence and an impact on those around us who are aware of of the Holy Spirit's influence in our heart and mind through our attitude. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming this evening. You are dismissed. Oh, offering. If you have an offering, see uh, Brother John or uh, Brother Lloyd's not here. Anybody else got an offering bag? Brother BJ. Brother BJ. See Brother BJ. Oh, Janice said you can get